Hello, everyone. Welcome along to the SBK Betting Podcast. We're recording a day earlier than normal. It is Wednesday today. Recording as it is all weather finals day as customary on Good Friday. So this Friday coming up. And this, I think, is when Tom Collins comes into his own. Not only is it all weather finals day, Dubai World Cup uh, on Saturday, turf, dirt, internationals. So really, TC, first things first, sum up the quality of racing we have this weekend if you're a Tom Collins type of racing man yeah it's one of the best weekends of the year i know everyone's going to be looking at this and think god this saturday in uk is pretty dire but no good friday i loved all weather racing we all know this and it's great that good friday is the platform for all weather to really succeed and everyone to watch the racing on terrestrial tv with itv and also on sky sports racing and then you've also obviously got dubai as you've mentioned with the dubai world cup and the brilliant undercard including an arabian race which i will touch on later And in the US, you've got the Florida Derby on Saturday, amongst other races. So a phenomenal weekend, if you're including the Friday, of action. Yeah, certainly. So we'll we'll, probably from that point of view, difficult for you to sum down uh, your main selection. So uh, we'll look forward to going through that. Um, Obviously, this is a weekend when Ross Miller comes into his own as well. And I'm sure there's the same levels of enthusiasm. But let's be honest actually lots of graded racing action over over the over in the national hunt sphere with fairy house and the irish national on monday so there's plenty and i know that you're going to share your selections when the declarations come out over the next couple of days yeah i mean it's important isn't it there's there's races for everybody and i think too often people will try and cover everything and you simply can't you can you can look at certain things the all weather doesn't massively do it for me so i tend to you know keep keep an eye on it but don't delve into it so the jumping for me this weekend is a good card at haydock like you say at fairy house on monday that will be where my attention has been but i have given this as much uh, as much thought as i can brilliant and that's uh with that in mind i think we've got a really good race for you to do that um in in that sense as well because the all weather friday meeting all the finals day is attracted some good horses but it's got a A very decent race in the 410, the All Weather Easter Classic Middle Distance Handicap. Really good field. And, you know, when we've talked about poor field sizes throughout the course of the National Hunt season, this whole card in general has been really well supported. And we've got uh, runners, as always, over from Ireland. We've also got uh, runners over from France. But we've got 15 and only max 14 in this field. So there's one reserve in here. Um, And it's a a really good looking lineup. And, I really think, TC, we'll start with you first. I wonder if Simon and Ed Crisford ever thought that oh so grand, who's currently uh, the, the favourite antipost at the moment for this race, They, I wonder if they thought they would meet Penzance, who they formerly trained, in a race like this when they sold them for 31,000 guineas to the horse watchers last, ju- last July. Because, you know, of course, this the son of Wooten Bassett has absolutely flown since they've moved, he's moved yards to McAppleby's, up 14 pounds, and then... As uh, you know, oh so grand, you're you're winning nap. I think it was back in January in the winter in winter oaks. Now they face off each each other. It's it's quite interesting uh, w- with that in mind, and it's not just about them those two either. It's a, a really deep field for them to compete against. Yeah, it's a really good race. Some of these all weather championship races do become something like a match race, or there's an odds on favourite and whatnot over the years. But this contest is far from it. It's definitely the best race of the day in England, and. Yeah, you've mentioned two main horses there in the race, but we haven't talked about the likes of Claymore, who drops down from a group three. Timusius Fox, who was arguably one of the most impressive all-weather winners of the winter when he sluiced up at Kempton last time. You've also got Elegant Man coming across from Ammo Racing and Ireland. He's two from three in his career and rated quite high. He could be a group horse too. And for football fans, Antoine Griezmann's got a runner in the race in hooking, coming over from France. So it's a really good event. I think the market's kind of got it right. <clears throat> with Oso Grand and Penzance being at the top of the betting. And as you say, I really loved Oso Grand prior to the Winter Oaks last time. And she kind of proved me right in that race, albeit she was way more impressive than I thought she was actually going to be. I mean, she took that corner, that slingshot corner coming into the home straight at Lingfield and just sprinted past her rivals. It was a real assertive performance. Uh, she was imperious and way the best in the race. Now, coming into this event, you're thinking she's on a four-timer. She represents connections that are really in good form. What's going to go wrong? Well, I don't think there really is a negative for her. The only reason why I'm jumping ship, and I know many punters are very loyal, and if they fancy a horse as much as I fancied Oso Grand last time, they will generally stick with them next time up. I'm going to jump ship, and it's just the course. 
Now, I know she's won at Newcastle before, but she is very much a quickener. She has a wicked turn of foot over this kind of distance, and that is how she's managed to rack up three consecutive victories. Newcastle, with the long home straight, different topography to the likes of Lingfield, Wolverhampton, etc. You need to be able to have an ability to sustain an effort that is way more crucial than the ability to quicken. Now, obviously, acceleration is obviously crucial in all kinds of flat racing or weather racing or whatnot. But if you only do it for a furlong and then start to falter and slow down, you're not going to win at Newcastle because they get racing way, way too far out in most of these events. So on that basis, I have to oppose her because she's favourite. And I just think Penzance is a more likely and logical winner in this race. Now, you talked about there, Simon and Ed Crisford used to have this horse and they definitely wouldn't have expected him to hit these heights so quickly after they offloaded him. But it is the horse watchers and Mick Appleby. We know what they've done when they've teamed up in the past. And 31,000 for this horse has proved to be a right sniff, hasn't it? Penzance won his last four races. He's gone from mark of 73 to 98. So it's a quick £25 rise in the handicap. And many people may look to offload him for that reason. You know, this horse is now competing against much better rivals than he has been in the past. However, I think there's been clear signs in his last two starts that there's still plenty to come from him. I don't think the tank has ever really gone empty in any of his last four races, including when he only just beat Stormcatcher here two starts back. Now, he made a bid from the front that day. The pace completely collapsed, but he was always on the speed. He went clear. Stormcatcher, in his typical way, loomed up large and really travelled through the race well. Actually uh, passed Penzance with 50 yards to go, but Penzance rallied. And Ali Rawlinson never got to the bottom of him. <clears throat> you know, he was just nudging out. He looked to his left. Their stormcatcher, Penzance immediately picked up and went past him. Now, you don't see that all that often at Newcastle, especially with the wind you tend to get there. Last time up, again, the race probably didn't go to plan on a track that I don't think suits him as well as Newcastle. So the switch back to this venue with the long straight, I think from a decent draw where Ali Rawlinson can get into a nice position, Penzance has to be the favourite in here. And I'm really hoping the horse watchers get another win because the way they campaign their horses is phenomenal. Arguably the best of any owner in the country on the flat. They deserve to, to get a big prize and uh, Penzance should do it for them here, in my opinion. Yeah, a very well thought out case, I think, TC. And I completely um, agree with everything you, you said. There's no point repeating it. And I think, I wonder what you think, the fact that Elegant Man is in the race with the rating of 108, 9 stone 12, it, God, that must help. The likes of Penzance, yes, he's gone up in the rating, but he's got a lovely racing weight in this because of those higher rated in who have turned up here. Yeah, exactly. It's not like he's running and carrying 10 stone in this race. You know, he's only carrying 9-2. Now, I know he's gone up the weight. So if you go back two months, he would be carrying way less. But as I say, I think there's still more potential for him to be rated 105 to 108 like Elegant Man is right now. So arguably, he's still well handicapped. These types of horses don't usually get missed in the market because they've got a string of ones next to their name. But because he's running in such a race with the likes of Elegant Man, oh so grand, two his Fox, who have all won very well recently, I still think there's value there. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I think uh, around about four to one, but we'll see how those prices change. I'll be really interested to see what this market does over the next couple of days. As you say, Elegant Man, a son of Arrogate, a still an entire horse, could be anything really. We don't really know, especially trying to translate the, the form from Dundalk last time. Tyson Fury is coming over, who was second to him. As they obviously think a good bit of him that he can uh, run in a race like this. But running in a in a handicap, they they I don't know if they you think that if he is really a, a top level, they would be giving him a go in, in, a, in a better class of race. But look, we shall see. Um, David Egan and Amma Racing have had a, a great start. They had Mr. Professor last weekend in the Lincoln. And um, as uh, TC has quite rightly said, it's not a two-horse race. It's not about the, the Oso Grand v Penzance. There's so much depth to it, Ross. I'm sure, as you mentioned, you know, you might not be a a massive fan of the all weather season throughout throughout most weekends, but you can appreciate races of this quality. Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen plenty of sort of talk about Penzance through my social media. I saw a bit with Chris Dixon sort of talking. They still think this horse has got more to give. So I sort of went back through his form and just a little bit of value maybe showed itself to me. So on New Year's Day, Penzance, as TC's just said, beat Stormcatcher at a short head. Penzance raced up with the pace. Stormcatcher came from a bit further back and challenged. Penzance was in receipt of £7 on that occasion. Stormcatcher went on his next start, went to Wolves and, and won a pretty easy assignment, but did it nicely. Now it comes back to Newcastle. He's on £6 better terms. From a very similar draw, they were uh, uh, 11, I think it was he came out of uh, on New Year's Day. He comes out of nine now on Friday. 
assuming the same sort of tactics play out and Penzance goes forward, there is a chance perhaps that he gets a bit softened up with, with plenty of horses that want to go forwards. I thought a six pound pull at the uh, at the weights was reasonable from a similar sort of draw. I could see a similar sort of thing uh, playing out and Stormcatcher challenging late. Maybe Penzance, if he has to go a bit harder in the early stages, won't have so much reserves to to repel him. He's available at 12 to 1 uh, versus Penzance, like you say, at around about 4 to 1, 7 to 2. So I thought there was a little bit of value there. Then you look back in third and there's old Sir Busker, who is, is without a win in, in coming on for two years now. I think it was July 2022. But he still runs very consistently. He was two and a quarter lengths away. He was giving Penzance £16, Stormcatcher £9. He gets a pull of £12 with Penzance, uh, £6 with, with Stormcatcher. And then prior to that, he was second again over course and distance behind Catcher Thief. Catcher Thief is in here at, at six to one. He was giving him £23. Now, Catcher Thief did put him away with a degree of comfort, but there's an £11 pull at the weights here now. Storm, uh, Sabuska's best form has come on this uh, track at Newcastle. Is one of his only two all-weather wins is here. He's again 12 to 1. So just looking at it in a very sort of broad sense, I thought those two at 12 to 1 were a little bit of value against horses that they've got form with, legitimately have got reason to get a little bit closer, who are much shorter in the market. Yeah, and I think this is to TC's point again, you know, the market will be kind of revolved around the kind of hyper horses with the ones to their names, the ones that had probably got slightly more patchy form. And poor old Sabuska, the handicapper hasn't really been that kind to him. You know, he was beaten three and a half lengths last time. They've dropped him a pound. You know, he's such an admirable sort. They could just give him a little pull, but, you know, every little helps, but a pound, oh, it's, it'll be, it still might be tough. But as you say, his most his, his best performance to date recently came off this rating so let's hope that maybe that just that gives him a little edge but it's yeah it's it's a race of a lot of depth but he always shows himself with a lot of credit that horse and another thing is, is Simon Pierce you know a man with not a huge string with a lot of storm catchers in his yard but this is a, a kind of horse that's been his real flag bearer so you know, as TC says, the horse watchers deserve uh, to win a race of this nature with a horse of that. But you really hope that, you know, do it for the good guys, the younger guys like Simon Pierce, who is really trying to build and strengthen out his string. So I think there's a lot of storylines going on in this race and there's a lot of lot to take away from it. And um, uh, let's hope Stormcatcher and Sabuska can run good races as, as Ross has put them up. Um, I'm with TC with, with Penzance. I'm not going to repeat what he said here. I've just been really taken away by what they've, how they've really thrown this horse on his head. I, I don't know whether he might have had a, a had an issue coming out of Simon Ned Christford. They obviously had him off the track for a little bit, but whatever they've done, they sweetened him up and he just seems to be thriving. And I think Wooten Bassett's really do that. They get better as they get older. And um, yeah, let's, let's see if he can keep up that trajectory. So that's the uh, all weather Easter classic middle distance handicap. Now, there is plenty more we, we want to try and get through in a small amount of time here. Um, we've got the rest of the all weather handy uh, all weather finals day. Um, we know that Ross is going to give us some selections uh, for the weekend, um, but TC uh, there's also Maidan as well. So we're going to let's go with Naps and Next Best for this day. And Ross, you might have yours for the weekend, but I know that uh, TC definitely have got more for this day that you want to share. Yeah, I'll start with my nap, which is actually on Saturday, but my fri my uh, next best is on Friday on uh, Weather Championship Day. My nap, we're filming this on Wednesday uh, morning, so there is no final decks yet. Hopefully this horse gets in the field. It's another horse watcher's owned runner, and I've actually messaged Chris Dixon, but he hasn't replied yet, so I blame Chris uh, if this horse doesn't run. Um, the nap is going to be Walsingham in the 520 at Musselburgh on Saturday. Uh, look, I'm really keen on him in this race. <clears throat> the horse watchers went to 50,000. To purchase this son of Lope de Vega from Ireland, used to be trained by Dermot Weld. He ran to a fair level on numerous occasions over on uh, the Emerald Isle. And I'm very surprised the handicap has dropped him down to a mark of 78. He's only had eight starts in his career. On five of those occasions, he's run to an RPR, race and post rating, of 84 or higher. Now that tells me, one, he's pretty consistent at that mid to high level 80 kind of performance. And two, there's probably more improvements to come. So why is he running off 78? Therefore, this is a very shrewd pickup. I know they went to a little bit more than the horse watchers generally go to for these horses in training pickups, but 50,000 could be a good buy in Walsingham. He could easily become a 100 rated or high 90 rated horse in time. And I love this finishing effort. Last time up at Leopardstown, when his former connections decided to change tactics. Previously, they were going forward with him. 
last time at Leopardstown, they held him up in mid-division. They came with a big late run and he flew in the final half of Furlong. He just failed to get up on the line. And if he won that race, he might not have even gone to the sale. So uh, I think Walsingham's a very interesting runner. Now, he does come off a layoff. That is a bit of a concern. And we've seen with Penzance, he's four from five for these new connections. But first time up, he only finished fourth. And it's clearly improved step by step since. So maybe Walsingham won't be at his best. But I don't think he even needs to be to win this race in the 520 at Musselburgh on Saturday. My next best is on Friday. <clears throat> comes in the All-Weather Championship Marathon Race, 153 at Newcastle. Interesting race again, full of very good horses. Um, I'm going to side with the improver, and that's vaguely royal for John and Thady Gosden. Older horses have a pretty good record in this race, but I really like the lightly raced profile of this four-year-old. He battled back very well to win over a mile and a half at this track in October. Backed that up at Lingfield up a sim- uh, over a similar kind of distance. And his last two starts, they ran him again over a mile and a half, again on a tighter turning track. And that race just developed into a real sprint and he couldn't go with them in the latter stages. He's very one paced. Jonathan Eddie Gosden are obviously super smart trainers. They're the best. Uh, and they realised that this also needs more distance. So they stepped him up to two miles last time. And I actually really loved the performance. I thought he definitely shaped like the best horse in that race. So he sticks to the distance today on a more galloping track at, at Newcastle, which I think is definitely going to help him. He's clearly well handicapped. And if they get racing early, as they tend to do, as I've already mentioned at this venue, hopefully his stamina can come into play and he can just grind them all down in the last furlong. So I'll take Vaguely Royal in the 153 at Newcastle as my next best. Yeah, interesting horse that. You don't actually see Bjorn Nielsen with that many runners anymore, but Vaguely Royal horse that they've, they've, I think they thought he was a proper Melrose horse at one stage, but he was a bit disappointing in that. But good to see that they've really sort of found the key for him. Um, so that's vaguely Royal, 153 at Newcastle, and then 520 at Musselburgh. Can the horse watchers do it again and uh, improve another another sort that they bought from the horse and training sales? That's Walsingham, uh, their first run for them with David O'Meara now, the trainer, um, as I said, 520 at Musselburgh. Okay, right, Ross, what have you got for us? Um, I know we've got something else coming separately. So watch this space on social media for some of the racing for the weekend. But anything else from Friday? Yes, I've got, I have two for Saturday. But there was one that just caught my eye when I was going through the the three all-weather cards on Friday. And it was in the 3.15 uh, at Lingfield. Anyone that knows me will know I'm partial to a marathon or a Snickers, as it's now called. But I do like the two-mile marathon handicap at Lingfield. And it's the Ben Brookhouse-trained Sarsons Risk. He was quite impressive when winning at Southall three starts ago, went up £4 for that. And it was quite a strong performance in that coming to sort of two furlongs out, it was, is he going to get there? Is he not against the favourite? And actually at the line, he was comfortably on top and, and drawing away. Um, went up £4 for that. Next start at Newcastle, met plenty of trouble in running under Dougie Costa though. Um, still finished a good effect into fifth. And his latest run came over a mile three at Southall. That looks to me like it was a, mar- a run designed to protect his mark. He actually got a pound back, so he's only three pound higher than for that win at Southall. Returns after a 66-day layoff. He's two from three when running off uh, the back of a layoff of 60 days or more. Um, I think this looks like it's been a target from some way out. Um, so Sarsen's risk in the 315 would be my all-weather selection. OK, yes, thank you for that. And uh, as said, mentioned again, we will have some more coming through um, uh, separately on, on social media, on Twitter for um, the, the weekend's jump action. We will not ever uh, let you down, you jumps fans. But uh, as mentioned as well at the start, we've uh, got the declarations in for May Dan for the Dubai World Cup meeting. Um, they came through on Monday. Uh, we don't have the draws yet for the Group One races as we as we record um, on, on Wednesday, but uh, they will come a bit later. So that's probably going to sh- reshape things up a little bit from a selections point of view. But as TC, as you mentioned at the start, a really great day of of racing uh, into the evening time at May Dan. I think one of the best Dubai World Cup nights that they've had in a long long time a uh, rewarded for a lot of prize money they've put up and uh international competition but you've a bit of a curveball for us because you've got an arabian race that you want to give us some insight into yeah it's a fantastic card definitely as you say i think the dubai world cup is actually lacking a little bit of depth that it usually has but aside from that the undercard is way better than usual uh i hope yush Tazora goes close to the dubai world cup again i hope forever young goes close in the uae derby but this card does not start at 12 o'clock, like it says on Racing Post. It starts at 11.30. Give me the Dubai Kahala Classic. That's what I want, Jess. The Arabian Horses. It's a Group 1. 
and many people are going to overlook this because they don't care about Arabian races. But I tell you, this is a good field of horses. I mean, I wouldn't have looked at this before this season, but I've been over to Saudi Arabia too much this term that I have to give this more emphasis. Um, you've got the likes of Durgam Athba for Lucas Gaitan. This guy is strike rate is around 33%. In Saudi Arabia, phenomenal. So don't look, don't look past that horse. You have the UAE runners, the likes of first class for Doug Watson. You got Al Arkham as well. And then you have the two big ones, the two Saudi Arabian horses coming across. Tilal Al Khaladia, super impressive on Saudi Cup night on the turf. Adel Al Faradi, the best jockey in Saudi Arabia, rides him. But it's his stable companion, Aspan Al Khaladia, my favourite Arabian horse in training. How many times do you hear that on a podcast based in the UK? Not very often. Hopefully he gets the job done under Abdul Alafi. Look, I don't know what price he's going to be. Hopefully the traders haven't been watching all of his races in Saudi this year and they go five to four or six to four or something like that about him. He's going to be crazy. He's never lost. He's unbeaten in 17 career starts. Super impressive in the Obaya last time up. Yes, they've got to go to Maidan. Slightly different track to Riyadh. More kickback. Different kind of topography to it. But he's going to be in third or fourth in the early stages. I don't think Abdullah Alafi is going to get stuck in behind horses because that's not what you should do on Arabian. Uh, if you don't watch Arabian races, the big difference between them and thoroughbreds, thoroughbreds can quicken. Arabian horses generally can't. And also they've got a completely different mindset. They don't have their mind on the job nine times out of ten. This horse does. Arguably, he races like a thoroughbred. I think he's going to win pretty decisively. Hopefully the traders aren't watching. They go five to four. Aspan al Khaladia in the Dubai Kahala Classic at 11.30, Jess. Fascinating. And look, I will be there and I we were discussing whether we were going to be handicapping this because I'm working for an American channel and we didn't know enough about the form. Now we do. So I'm going to credit Tom <laughs> Collins when I'm on TV on Saturday because you've given me a lot more insight. Out of interest, do because there isn't as much in, insight into it mm-hmm. relatively available, will the markets, will the traders find it difficult to price it up? I mean, I know he's got ones all to his name, so he looks like he must be a pretty useful horse, but it's difficult to really know compared to some of the others. So does that mean there might be some value there? Well, as I say, I was in Riyadh for most of the season uh, and type for most of the season this year. They didn't, bookmakers didn't originally have any markets until around December, January time, and then they started pricing up. And every card in Saudi Arabia, there's two Arabian races, 12 race cards, 10 thoroughbred, two Arabians. At the start, the traders had no idea how to price these Arabian, Arabian races. But as the season went on, they got a bit better. To be honest, I don't think they're going to mess this one up in terms of prices. But the fact that Tilal al Khaladir is against Aspan al Khaladir could mean that they are a bit tentative on both counts. Tilal's got a very similar record. He's only been beaten once this year, beaten by a horse called Vizier, who's a nice animal. But... Vizier is nowhere near as good as Aspan al Khaladir. They both come in with loads of ones next to their name. Hopefully they think it's a match. I don't think it is. Okay. And I can't press you for a nap in from the actual thoroughbred racing on the probably, day you wait for the draws. Probably forever, uh, forever young in the UAE derby. I think he did phenomenally well over in Saudi uh, Riyadh that day. He was on the wrong lead. He managed to come down the centre of the track and just pin the US runner, uh, Bukum Dano. So I, I think uh, forever young is probably one of the best bets in the UAE derby. But he's a short price. I'm more excited about the Arabian race, I have to say. OK, well, let's hope it starts on a, on a high for you. I think um, for what it's worth, the Japanese, as, as, as we know, happened last year, are going to have a brilliant, a brilliant Dubai World Cup. Looking forward to it. But I do think there's a lot of uh, depth and intrigue around the Dubai Gold Cup. Um, and the only problem is, and the reason why I'm a little bit tentative about this, is because all the fancied horses are all drawn really badly. You don't want to be to in a double figure number really um and we've got the likes of tower of london in store 14 you've got trawler man who is my selection in 16 you've got enemy in 13 elder elder of is in 10 which is it's just un, it's, it's strange really how this will pan out but i think you know they're all going to try and, and get to that front and that's what they'll do but trawler man of all is the horse that really does well off the lead and i just think it might be hard to he might be quite hard to peg back he's fresh he's fit he's he's a horse that comes in here with a you know a, a winter off off his back but I just think he is improving improving um, I was lucky enough to speak to Kieran Schumark who is so excited to have this ride he thinks this horse is a genuine gold cup in Ask at Royal Ascot contender we know what he did when he beat Kiprios I just think he might be a little bit overlooked still uh, I think Tower of London is could be beatable it would have been a heavy enough race um, last time in, in Saudi and enemy we saw what happened to him last year when he was 
I think he was second at Saudi and then he was down the field uh, in Dubai. And I think, I don't know, it might just take a little bit out of them, these stayers. So I'm happy to go for Trollham in the fresh horse in, in the Dubai Gold Cup, but just a, a nervousness around this draw. Um, but looking forward to it massively indeed. And I just so looking forward to seeing how uh, TC gets on, because will you do any any more selections on, on your columns? Or if we if you if, if we want to follow a little bit more of what you what you like over the weekend, Tom? Yeah, so Friday, my actual column for SBK will be on just all over the Championship Day on Friday. But on my Twitter, uh, I'll be posting all my selections for Dubai World Cup night. Can I quickly just mention the Godolphin Mile? I know we should keep this section short, but Saudi Crown is going to be a very short price favourite. And it is the first thoroughbred race of the day. So lots of punters will be looking at this race and think Saudi Crown could be a great start to double my money and move on to the remaining races. He's way the best horse in this event. But he would have been 110% primed. I hate that phrase. I hate when people say 110% because it's physically not possible. But they would have done that with Saudi Crown uh, when they were going to the Saudi Cup. Connections, FMQ stables who own him are Saudi-based. That is his D-Day. He's even money. I actually prefer Isolate uh, at 5-2. to two. He won the race last year. So I think that's a very good match to get started with. But be tentative with Saudi Crown because horses can drop off. When they hit their peak, they can drop off straight after. And this is a decent race as well. It's not like he's coming in at a one to four shot. He's an even money shot. Probably isolates the bet. Yeah, interesting. With Louis Saez on board, and I just think Tyler Gaffioni has been giving him so many good rides, but he's obviously in America. So Louis Saez just needs to try and get him out of 11, gun him to the front as best as he can do, because that's the that's a slight worry for me. But yeah, I think that's a really good race indeed. So we could be here all day, TC, going through this and <laughs> lots to look forward to. Keep an eye on, on your social, on, on TC social media. Keep an eye on SBK social media in general, because Ross will have his jumping selection. So a lot uh, to look forward to. So I hope, you, uh, hope we found a winner for you. Um, don't forget, as always, all new SBK users get £30 in free bets when you sign up and bet £10 for the first time. Plenty of options this weekend when it comes to that. Uh, head to SBK, as you know, for lots of other offers and promotions throughout this weekend. Enjoy it. Enjoy it wherever you're tuning in and w whatever is your preference. But uh, all we can say, racing is definitely the winner here, um, as the very cliche saying goes. So have a great weekend and we'll see you next week.